Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, we have EXT's new suspension fork, a crazy new hardtail and a mixed wheel size bike from Kona. We also check out a new prototype intent for Aaron Gwynn. And another iteration of that progressive geometry bird ether. So this week we see the release of the new era fork from EXT. So this is an air fork, although apparently there will be a coil option underway sooner or later. So it's for 29ers, with travel ranging from 140 to 170. It's got 36 mil legs with 44 millimeters offset. So it's got a couple of interesting things going on. So the air chamber uses a three chamber system. Now there are a couple of brands doing this, but this one does have some small variations. So first of all, it actually uses a coil spring for the initial part of the stroke. Now this should hopefully give you the support of air, and we'll get onto that later on as well, but with the small bump compliance of coil. So how does a three air chamber system work? Well, the main air chamber compresses until it reaches a certain kind of uh, threshold. And then once the pressure reaches that, it will begin to compress the second positive air chamber. So this is gonna allow you to fine tune ramp up as well as support throughout the mid and late part of the stroke. The damper has high and low speed compression adjustment as well as rebound and uses a very large 22 mil diameter piston with quite a high volume of oil as well. The reason they do this is because they want something that feels great and consistent on long runs. So that damper also uses a coil sprung IFP, which yet again is similar technology to that employed by a Fox in their Grip2 damper as well as some others. So also like Fox with that 38 where it has that oval steerer, the crown actually extends further up the crown steerer unit on these EXT forks. Now that's to increase basically overlap, which will in turn hopefully it should increase stiffness. So I think this is very interesting indeed. Like I said, they've caused quite a stir online as people are clamoring to get a set. And I think they could be very exciting indeed. Okay, so next up in news is a new set of wheels from Raceface. So this is them on screen. They're called the Turbine. Uh, they're the F35 model. So that's a 35 millimeter rim internal width. Uh, yeah, that's right there. Nice, wide, supportive rim. Uh, ideal really for tires bigger than 2.4, so anything up to about 2.8, so they'll do the plus size. Uh, great for the e-bikes. Really, really quite cool, actually, by all accounts. They've also been optimized to really resist burping. They've got quite an aggressive profile on the hook there for the tire bead. Now, at the heart of these wheels, this I'm just gonna cut the chase, they've got that Volt hub. Now, this is the hub. It's available in three different options to serve micro spline, XT drivers, and a regular splined body. It's got 120 points of engagement via six pulls. Now, each of those six has a double head on it, so it's almost instantaneous with just three degrees of rotation and the noise they make is unreal. Um, you might not like that, but it sounds incredible. Super fast pickup, and they've got oversized bearings on them as well. Everything about these hubs is designed to be burly and last a long time. Now, interesting thing about race face wheels is they're actually the same company as Eastern. Eastern make and represent the road side of things and race face do the mountain bike side of things. Uh, Eastern, as you might recall, used to make some excellent wheels known as the Arc wheels themselves. Um, we're talking five years ago, and of course now Raceface represents that part of them. Um, now the Eastern wheels were excellent, and these new Raceface ones are even better because they've got the new hubs in them. Uh, they're available in boost, so 110 up front, uh, 148 on the rear, but also super boost, so 157. Double butted spokes, and they've also got four and a half mil offset on the, uh, the, the spoke nipple holes on the rim. Um, couldn't even get my words out there straight, basically to make a slightly stronger wheel. Uh, here's some more shots of them on screen. Now the hubs themselves come in a variety of different colors, including blue, silver, black, amazing copper color, and purple, I had to check on that one. And the rims come in black, but you can get the decal kits in almost any color under the sun, so you can customize them to suit your bike. I think they look really, really good. They've absolutely got their wheels nailed now. So if you're in the market for a new set of wheels, these look brilliant. Um, what else is that to say? Oh, the price, uh, about 900 US dollars. I haven't got a price in pounds sterling or euros, unfortunately, but you can kind of work it out from there. Um, I think that's a fair price for a really burly set of wheels. 
Awesome, back over to Henry now. Now we have a new bike from Bird. This is their Ether 9C. So this is Bird's first foray into carbon frames. And it looks really, really smart actually, especially the high gloss finish. So it's a 130mm 29er paired to anywhere between 130 and 150 mil travel on the front. It comes with the radical angles you'd expect from Bird, although admittedly other brands are starting to catch up. So it's got a 65 degree head tube angle, and when it comes to the seat tube angle, it gets a little bit interesting because they're actually doing size specific seat tube angles. That's because basically as you run more seat post, it kind of takes your, your body weight further back, especially on bikes with slacker seat tubes. But to reap the benefits of a steeper seat tube, they want it to be kind of unanimous and across the board and you not be penalized for running a lot, you know, higher amounts of post out the bike. So that means there's a 76.5 seat tube angle on the medium and that steepens all the way to 78 degrees on an XL, which is pretty steep indeed. Also accompanying the bike is one of the best geometry charts going, which I know sounds like a real nerdy thing to praise, but I think it's great to see that level of transparency and detail, especially in the way they annotate it. So the sizes go from medium to XL and the reach is within that range from 455 all the way to 541. So a big bike to pair with those relatively steep seat tube angles. It's interesting, they're actually changing the front triangle depending on rider size, but they're sticking with 430 mil chainstays throughout. You know, some brands change chainstays, some don't, but it's interesting Bird have approached the problem of needing, you know, size specific geometry but haven't felt the need to look at the chainstays. Now, I'm sure they've got kind of a very firm and clear ideology when they're building the bike, but I just think it's really interesting and worth making a note. Maybe the place we should be custom tuning our frames for size is actually on the front triangle, not the rear. Who knows? It seems that Yeti have been launching lots of new bikes recently, and here is another one. This is their Arc. So you might have seen the anniversary edition of this floating around on the internet in the crazy old school Yeti colors, but this is the production one. It's the Arc in line. And oh man, this thing looks really nice. So it's a hardtail bike, but unlike previous hardtails from Yeti, uh, they did have the dirt jump frame way back, um, but their previous hardtail frame was an XC race frame. They look to, to be departing the race world at the moment. So this is not designed around a 100 mil fork, it's designed around a 130 fork. Uh, as you can see from this profile, it looks like a very modern trail bike. Now note that it's not crazy aggressive, it's not for a longer travel fork, it's not wildly slack. It's got 67 degree head angle with a 130 mil fork. Uh, it's aimed at a trail rider and I think it looks really good. A nice steep seat angle. There's a few more shots of it on screen. So you've got a 76 degree seat angle, uh, effective of course on there. Uh, actually it looks pretty steep though, the actual seat angle on there. A uh, 67 degree head angle on there, 433 mil chainstays and four sizes with the reach topping out at 490. So the reach goes from 420, 445, 465 and 490. So that's a really good variety of size in there. So an extra large really, you could be running a 30 mil stem on their 490 mil. So man, that's a pretty progressive bike for them, but yet it still hits the super lightweight category. Um, that's something that really pleases me because I'm not really that interested in the 100 mil hardtail. I think you can get a bit more out of hardtails these days, but I'm not always keen on going super aggressive, but there is a really cool super aggressive hardtail coming a bit later on the show. Um, so as of all Yetis, you get options of the grade of carbon. Similar to Santa Cruz, you get a Turk series, which come in that classic iconic turquoise color and you get the c series uh, turks are a bit more expensive they're known as the t's um, so pricing you've got the c1 and the c2 they are from 4,290 euros to 4,690 euros respectively and then the t series the turk series a bit more expensive 5,490 euros to 5,890 euros. They're complete builds in the T1, uh, T1, T2, C1 and C2 build. So the T1 and C1 build is an XT transmission, pretty similar to what I built my, really my ultimate bike around actually, which is around the SB100. But um, yeah, I think it's a really good looking bike. I like kind of am partial to a hardtail. I've not ridden a hardtail for some time. Uh, last time it was a Nuke Proof Scout 290 and uh, beat me up by all accounts. That's something quite nice about them. Do you guys and girls still like hardtails out there? Does anyone still ride a hardtail and prefer it over a full sus? Have you got an XC style hardtail, a trail hardtail? Uh, let us know in those comments. Let's have a bit of a hardtail discussion. And in fact, we could probably theme an ask show. So if you've got any hardtail related tech questions, uh, let us know in those comments, but use ask GMBN tech as the hashtag. And then we can fish those ones out and we'll do a hardtail special. Um, probably over, long overdue. Cool.
Now, Doddy and I aren't exempt from scrolling our lives away on Instagram, and we have spotted a couple of cool things floating about. So the first is this from Rock's Lead Suspension. And, I mean, it looks quite bizarre, to be fair. Very, very different, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. So we saw this fork floating about a while ago, and it was kind of in that same conversation with the, uh, the trust fork that was going around about these linkage forks, though this seems to be a slightly simpler execution. Similar on the back end, that big swing arm. I think it actually looks really, really cool. Like I said, if not slightly unconventional, that's no bad thing. Now, one brand that has a history with being unconventional and doing things their own way is, of course, Intense. So this is the new M279 prototype for Aaron Gwynn, and it looks something of a work of art. You can just see those little spot welds beginning to go in there to keep all that frame in the exact position for the proper welding to go on and it does look absolutely gorgeous. That was over on Jeff Steber's Instagram. The final piece is something that could have a warm reception with bike mechanics everywhere that have faced the problem of once you've taken out the fork, what do you do with all the spaces and the stem, the headset, yada, yada, yada. So this is actually a new dummy fork tool from Park, and you just slot it in, leave the bike to one side, you'd even hang it up, I suppose, in storage, and then when the fork comes back from a service, you can just pop that straight back through. So I think that looks really good, and new tools are always gonna be a good thing. Okay, last up in news are new bikes from Kona, so the 2021 range. Now there's a load of bikes, and you can see all sorts of stuff floating around online, but really the two main bikes you need to know about are the Process X and the Honzo ESD. Now the Honzo, traditionally was an XC Race Hardtail 29er bike with an incredibly short back end, four 15 mil chainstays with 29 inch wheels. Insane. Now, I rode that four or five years ago and when I first got the bike, I thought this is ridiculous. Like, um, that is just far too short for a hardtail. You're gonna be looping out, you're not gonna have enough traction on the front end because it's gonna be so short on the back, but I was completely wrong. Uh, the front end geometry is really nice and long, it's really planted, um, an incredible bike and actually I was gutted to give it back after I'd been riding that bike for a few months. Uh, I really got along with it, um, but I did kind of wish there was a slightly more aggro version of it. I think it had a 120 mil fork on it, the one that I was riding. And I was thinking, God, you could get a 130, 140 fork on it, no problem. And that's what they've just done. So this is the ESD you can see on screen. Look how progressive and aggressive this thing looks. Mega slack, so 63 to 63 and a half degrees up front. Like That's about as slack as you get. So all you free ride downhill style riders out there, you will love the look of this thing, I'm sure. Uh, it's got longer chain stays on the rear. It's funny, they say long, they're 435 mil chain stays. So that is actually short by a lot of brand standards but it's definitely long compared to the 415 that you get on the other models, which are more XC biased. So, um, some more shots on screen of this really aggressive looking hardtail. Uh, it's running a 42 mil reduced offset uh, fork on the front there, 150 mil travel with that 63 degree head angle on there. I mean, look at it, and look how steep the seat angle is. So that's a 77.5, so extremely steep. This thing is gonna winch up any climb, better than most hardtails because of that angle as well. It's not just about having a hardtail on the back, it's about the angle of your climbing position. Man, that is gonna think, that thing is really gonna climb up anything. It's gonna feel really, really aggressive. Uh, 29 inch wheels, four sizes from small to extra large. The sizing is really progressive as well with Kona these days, which I'm really pleased to say. Uh, 440 up to 525. 525 mil reach on an XL. Oh, that is what I'm talking about. Uh, that is absolutely bang on up there. I think this thing looks amazing. Kind of getting a bit of a love for a hardtail at the moment. So there's some good stuff floating around. I think that might be a little bit much for me though. The Yeti looked really good, but I did love the Honzo, which is kind of in the middle before, but this Honzo EST, Interesting. Let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, next up, we're gonna talk about the Process X. Now the Process series of bikes from Kona have pretty much always been amazing. Uh, in fact, probably one of my all time greatest bikes, I'll put it in my top 10, I'll put it out there, was the Process 111. That's a 29er, had a 120 mil fork and it had 111 mil travel on the back. One of the best bikes I've ever ridden still, uh, and it would be outdated now because of the fact it was an unboost and loads of other stuff, but still amazing. But this one 
Wow, okay, so it's 29 inch wheel, but you can run it mullet style setup, as they say in the press release. Uh, that means mixed wheel sizes, not talking about haircuts here. So you can run it 27 and a half or 29 on the rear. You've got flip chips, so you can adjust the BB height accordingly so it stays the same. It's also got a 63 degree head angle on there, so super aggressive, this bike. It's got adjustable chainstay length, so you might want to adjust the chainstay length for changing the wheel sizes, but also to change the characteristics. So you could have a 29er with 435, um, Sorry, I've got that wrong. Yeah, 435 or 450 mil chainstays. So you could have a 29er with effectively a short back end or a longer back end, depending on the sort of riding you want to do. Longer back end for more stability and out and out speed. 435 if you want to just pop up the front wheel all the time. And then of course, the same idea with running the smaller wheels. So you've got loads of options. There's almost four bikes in one there. Um, 63 to 63 and a half degree head angle, 78.2 degree seat angle. Man, these manufacturers are getting this now. So they're slack up front, they're steep in the middle where you need to wait bias to be. These bikes are looking really, really good. Uh, there's other bikes launching from Kona about this time as well. You're gonna see Process 153 and loads of other cool stuff, but this is the one for me uh, in the range. It's got this cool little bumper on the down tube as well, so if you wanna hook it over the back of a pickup truck, you're not gonna damage the frame. They are designing this for hard riding and for people that just wanna ride the bike. They don't wanna pay too much attention wrapping a frame up with you know protection and stuff. They just wanna get on it and hammer the thing. Um, yeah, a few more shots of it on screen. Not much else to say. Oh. Uh, wheel travel would help. 162 on the rear and 170 on the front. What a beast. Now it is time for this week's tech quiz. So the first question. Earlier on, we mentioned Extreme Racing Shocks and their new fork, the Era. But which country did EXT come from? And the next question. What is the difference between a four bar suspension system and a faux bar suspension system? So going back a bit there, it doesn't always go by that name nowadays, but I think it's a great name for a linkage. And the last question, which of these bikes isn't in specialized range? The Enduro, the Hot Rock and the Session. So which of those bikes plays no part in specialized range of bikes? <laughs> Okay, now it's time for Bike Cave. That is the place that you keep your bike. You work on your bike. Maybe you fix and help your friend's bikes or the local community's bikes. Uh, it could be a place under your stairs where you have to take your wheels off and chuck your bike in and close the door and pretend it's not in there. Uh, wherever you keep your bike uh, locked up at night, show it to us. We want to see your bike cave. Uh, tell us all about it. Tell us what your bike is, what you love doing to your bike in your bike cave. You might just want to change the inner cable when you need to, or you might love doing a full shock service. Whatever it is, it all counts here at GMBN Tech. There's a link right there, and there's a better one in the description underneath. You can click on it, it'll take you through to our uploader. Now, this first one is called Ultimate Bike Repair. Check this out. So you've got the big banners up on screen. And this is in uh, British Columbia. So it's from Rob, he's got Rocky Mountain Altitude, sticking close to home there for his bike choice. Uh, my garage has some weird built-in shelving made from 4x4 cedar, which I've reconfigured to turn it into my workshop. Um, it has a four place, uh, sorry, a fireplace for heat in the winter months. Man, you've got a fireplace in your workshop. Dude, that's amazing. And a 42 inch TV for watching GMBN. We haven't even got 42 inch TVs at work. You're having a laugh, mate. That's amazing. Um, fair play. All cleaned by a Dyson Hoover. Nice. So stick of some British made stuff there. Well, some British designed at least anyway. Um, all cleaned by Dyson. There's a mini fridge for cold beverages. Oh man, that's a dream. So you've got a fireplace in there and you've got beer. Why would you need to be anywhere else? Bikes, fire, beer. What else do you need in life? Brilliant. Um, dude, looks awesome. Ultimate bike repair, love that TV size. Um, the bench is great. Fireplace in there, it looks a wicked place to hang out. Uh, I'll tell you what you do need, if you can fit one in there, some sort of little sofa, something like that. So everyone can just hang out afterwards or just, you know, maybe if you're repairing a bike for someone, you get the tunes pumping, have a couple of beers on a Friday. Looks awesome. Super neat pegboard as well there, by the way. Meticulously so, that looks great. Love it. Thanks, Rob, for sending that in. That is an awesome bike cave. Okay, next up's from Andrew in uh, Marietta. He says, this is my bike cave. Oh, his bike, by the way, is the Salsa Timberjack SLX. This is my bike cave. I run a community bike repair for homeless folk and vets. Uh, it's not much and it's super crowded, but we've moved 600 plus bikes to it in the last five years. Wow. Um, the next step is to build a barn in the backyard to expand it. Andrew, you are amazing. Um, period for doing community work like this. Anyone that does any form of community work or helping anyone, um, I take my hats off to you, I think it's brilliant work. 600 plus bikes have been through that workshop. Dude, your workshop's tiny. That is amazing. So you must have a really good workflow 
for this. Uh, loads of spare parts hanging up on the wheels. Uh, dude, it doesn't matter if it's a mess. It's about knowing where stuff is. You know, I used to have a right old mess of workshop. I knew where everything was, so it didn't hinder me. Someone else walking in would be like, oh, what's going on? But uh, uh, it looks awesome and super cool to see doing community work. Love community bike shops. In fact, we've got a great one in Bath called the Julian, uh, Julian House Bike Shop brilliant bunch of guys i think there's a few more littered around uh, west country at least anyway and they're all super good guys they all love their bikes and they love reconditioning old bikes basically to raise money for julian house i think it's brilliant so in fact if there's anyone out there who's got any sort of charities associated with bikes or uh, helping local community stuff let us know because it'd be really cool to do some shout outs to everyone to make everyone aware of them um wicked way to go guys nice stuff andrew uh, next up is from caleb in over Cambridge, over Cambridge way, I guess then. Um, I've just finished my bike cave. There's no more information, but you've got a cool looking heart. You've got some strip lighting on the back. Have you been watching Blake's videos by any chance? That's very Blake Samson, I tell you. He loves a strip light. I think he used to have somebody under, underneath of his cars as well. You know, Blake Samson used to be a boy racer. True fact that. And also another fact about Blake Samson, he used to have uh, multiple Subaru Impressors and he once sold his beloved latest version of the Subaru Impressor, a proper WRX job. He sold it to Sam Reynolds. And Sam Reynolds, literally after handing over the cash, took Samson's ex Pride and Joy pulled over in a lay-by and rattle canned it matte black. Oh, can you imagine Blake's reaction to that? <laughs> Must have cried. Definitely, it's hilarious. Um, sorry, completely off topic there. But looking great, I tell you. Loads of cool stuff chucked away in there. Nice stuff, Caleb. And next up is from Pietro, which is, doesn't say where you are, just says at home. Got a Scott Spark 700RC Pro, very nice. Uh, Canyon Nerve 8.0 Cube Reaction GTC Race. During the corona lockdown, I've built a mountain bike for the first time without any help. Brilliant. I uh, always wanted to build one, but never did until now. It's a hardtail, a carbon cube frame mountain bike, and I'm really proud of myself. Uh, Pietro, that is amazing. Um, I, I've said for a long time, I think everyone, if they get the opportunity to try and build a bike themselves, um, even if it's like uh, maybe saving up and buying a frame and transplanting the stuff from your existing bike onto that new frame, it all counts. Building a bike itself is really, really good. It's quite therapeutic and it's really satisfying. So I'm stoked for you. Uh, the stoke is high today in the bike caves. Um, awesome work there. And there we go, that looks like the hard tower down the bottom there. Dude, you've got a lot of stuff in there. It looks great. What a cool setup. Amazing, okay, well, out of the bike cave. Keep them coming, folks. We absolutely love them. Now it is time for Top Mods. This is where we get to show off all your hard work. So if you've got your own submission of something you've tinkered away with at home, get into the uploader below and hopefully we can feature it on the show. So this first one is from Adrian and he is based in Queensland, Australia. And he's basically used the small tabs, that would actually be for one of those Fox Live systems, to fit a custom 3D printed mud guard. He's had to make it in a couple of different pieces and then bind them together later on using some zip ties to give kind of a, a shoelace or dare I say corset effect. And I think it actually looks pretty cool. You're seeing a lot of brands now actually come with um, fenders that come out with the fork, but these bolts were often infuri infuriating because you'd see them knowing that they could fit a fender but you didn't have the option to until recently when companies like RRP came to the fore, or even the new 38 coming with its own special fender. But these ones look great. He's even got the color to match his bike. I think Blake would be a fan of that. And I think it looks really, really cool. I've even just spotted you've got the, a custom colored uh, compression dial there. Or is that just a, a swanky filter you put on? I'm not sure. But the bike looks cool and I think um, it's great to see somebody doing some proper tinkering. Next, we have a submission from Wim, and this, I think, is a really, really cool bike. So it's their Surly bike backing bike, I suppose. And, I mean, Surly are kind of a household name when it comes to, you know, carrying, carrying your kit. And often, they kind of rely on a simple elegance, and they have a lot of fans for that. So this is a bike they're building up. It is a Karate Monkey. I can't actually say I'm overly familiar with the specific models in the range. But judging by the way you're setting it up, this bike is gonna go on some serious voyages. You've got some quite heavy duty spank rims there, which is definitely a good place to have heavy duty parts. But loads of bits and kit, dropper posts to still have loads of fun on. A rigid fork for simplicity and hard wearing, as well as, I suppose, lightweight if you're gonna be doing some serious miles on it. Going for some Ortley bike bags and, you know, the cherry on top of the cake. 
the USB dynamo, which is so useful if you're out in the wilderness and you do want to end up scrolling through Instagram looking at Aaron Gwynn's prototype, well, you're gonna need a bit of battery charging. So that is absolutely fantastic. If you go without one, I've done a bit of bike packing before without one, and basically, anytime you stop food is basically an, an operation and how many devices you can charge without annoying the restaurant or cafe owners as you just scramble for any port in the vicinity. So um, yeah, no, that's I think it's a probably more refined and elegant solution than getting in a fight in a cafe shop over who gets the fast charge port. So next we have a submission from Will in Auckland in New Zealand and this is their 26 inch wheeled XC bike and it's their son's first proper mountain bike. So he's actually passing it down to the daughter but thought let's make a proper job of it. We're going to do it up. Now I ate a lot of humble pie recently and almost got arsenic poisoning from sanding down my frame. So it's interesting to see that how well it's gone for you with the paint stripper and I don't, couldn't begrudge you for that. Couldn't begrudge you. No, nope, no, nope, good on you. <laughs> no, honestly, fair play. And you've done a really, really good job there. That that fade can't be that simple to do. And it's actually a three color fade because it goes from darker all the way through into the purple and the white. And actually wouldn't look out of place on a world champs bike. It was Bernard Kerr's bike in very similar colors for MSA, was it last year? But no, it looks absolutely fantastic. Left the bottom bracket in there, or an old bottom bracket, I presume, just to um, stop needing to chase the threads out or anything, which is a good call. And you've actually splashed some decent parts on that and all, which is gonna be a great, great bike, you know, for the kid ripping round. Absolutely fantastic. So thank you for getting all those submissions in. Please continue using the uploader link to feature them on the show. So thank you very much. And hopefully, if you're watching this right now and you've been playing with your bike, if you get your skates on, we could even feature it next week. Okay, now it's time for Rewind. This is where we get to go back in time and check out where all the latest mountain bike tech started out. Uh, if you've got anything old or you want to know anything about where stuff came from, or perhaps you've seen some weird old retro stuff you just want to know about it, let us know in those comments. Use that hashtag Rewind. Uh, but please, if you've got anything or you know anyone that's got anything, video some on your phone, tell us about it, uh, take some photos and send them to our uploader service. They are on the screen right there. The details for that is a better link in the description underneath. Anything counts, but 90s is the proper goal era of this stuff so if you've got anything 90s let's have it okay so first up this week is from in fact this is a big one this is all from Paul this week it doesn't say where he is just says my back garden with a little smiley face and it's a 1992 S Works Carbon so that's a specialized S Works S Works is their top end race division the real posh stuff um, kind of like a Ford gear I guess back in the day but look at this. So this is my 1992 S-Works Carbon, bought when I was 14 years old. Dude, that's awesome. Uh, ridden it regularly over the last 28 years. Upgrading components as they wore out. Had a big refresh around 2000, and then to the latest XTR group set and a Pace suspension fork. Only original parts of the frame and the saddle. I've included some photos when the bike was new, along with photos in the current state. Oh man, this is so good. You sound like completely my era here. Uh, probably similar age as well. Uh, I was 1979. Um, so I reckon you're probably around then as well. Uh, I was massively into mountain biking during the 90s and the noughties. It's been ridden all over the UK and been to spectator many an old school mountain bike classic. Several times to the Malvern Hills, yep, same here, uh, which was such an event back in the day. I've had less time for recreational riding over the last few years and mainly used for commuting to work. However, my son is seven and really loves his cycling, so that's rekindled my love. Finding your channel along with more time in lockdown, it's got me totally obsessed again. Oh man, that's really cool. Um, I spend every minute watching the channel and YouTube bike reviews and I desperately want a new bike. Seems that geometry's moved on a bit in the last 30 years. Loving the look of down country bikes, especially that transition spur. Need to get a saving. Yeah, do you know what? I, I could see those sort of style bikes. If anyone out there is confused by down country, just think of it as a cross country bike just with a bit more oomph, uh, a little bit more travel up front and slightly tougher tire. So you can ride something nice and light and agile, but just a little bit more on it. Um, really kind of a lightweight trail bike, I guess you would call it. Um, pretty ideal for a lot of people, by all accounts. Um, if you haven't seen it already, check out the video I made where I got to build pretty much my own interpretation of my ideal bike. I actually built up a 100 mil cross country bike as a kind of down country style bike. Um, check it out, it's a Yeti bike with Shimano XT transmission on it. 
Um, but really cool to see this, by the way. And you also say, if interested, I've got period photos of my 15 inch specialized hard rock on 24 inch wheels, um, plus photos from the Mulvans and Canic. Paul, get involved, please send them in. I'd love to see them. Um, I was probably at those early Mulvans. I think I did 91, two and three back then. So probably similar era to you. Um, please stay in touch and stay watching the stuff. This is great and so cool that your son's riding mountain bikes and stuff as well. And look at the pictures, all right, this is so cool. So here's the original bike here, uh, original SPDs on there as well. Uh, looking awesome, looking really nice. That classic Oakley sticker, Telltale. Everyone used to have the uh, die, die cut Oakley stickers on their bikes. Now, even if you had fake Oakley, you should still have the Oakley sticker to tell you mate, she loved Oakley. Crazy brand back then. Uh, there it is looking a bit dirty, oh man. Okay, so some modifications underway here. The ring lay bottle cages, eastern seat post, ring lay stem, paste fork on there. Some burlier tyres, there's that XTR. Oh, still looks great, doesn't it, that stuff? Do you know what, I love the look of the paste forks still. They look great. Wow, so are they Onza tie bar ends? Hmm, don't remember reading that. I probably read it and didn't pay any attention because I was so stoked at looking at stuff, but uh, they look like Onza titanium bar ends, if they are you have made of money. If not, they're just uh, the regular L-bends. But either way, very cool from back in the day. Everyone knows Onza tires these days, but Onza have been around for a long time making all sorts of stuff. They used to make clipless pedals. Instead of springs, I had elastomer rubber. A uh, great idea for saving weight, but terrible in really hot or really cold conditions because your foot would either fall out the pedal all the time with a soft spring, or you couldn't get out with a hard spring. But they were super light, so all the weight weenies loved them. I love the fact you've got those paste frame protection stickers that were basically a little lump of carbon fiber, soft soft carbon. Uh, yeah, looking good. XTR, uh, V-brakes on there. Oh man, look at this stuff. So nice to see. Oh, dude, I'm stoked on this. This is a great one for, um, for Rewind this week. There's those XTR brake levers, just like the ones I was working on on that GT recently that I showed you off. Yeah, look at it. Ring lace down the Eastern bar. Is that CT2? Yeah, CT, CT2 even. Yeah, there's our Onza bar ends. Look at them. Oh man. Do you know what? I don't miss bar ends, but I kind of miss how they looked. I would never go back to using them. I don't see the point, but uh, back then they were an essential. And also actually pretty good for keeping things off your hands as well, running through bushes and stuff. So could arguably have been a predecessor to hand guards. Yeah, those ringly bottle cages though, they're probably still the best looking bottle cages. And you can adjust the tension on them as well. Why has nobody done that before to solve the problem of bottles flying out? It existed in the 90s and it's still not been addressed. Um, although there are brands like Fidlock, to be fair, they're doing the locking style cages and they're a little bit different. PTs make a Fidlock bottle cage if you're looking for one of those. Very cool. And there we go, there's an XT shark fin on the chainstay. Now we've talked about these before. There used to be a phenomenon known as chain suck, where the chain would bounce up and down hopelessly, get stuck on the tire and, and find its way around on the tire side of the chainstay, or worse, it would get caught up in the gears and as you pedaled, would suck it up between the chainstay and the chain rings and you could take a gouge out your frame, you could snap your chain. And so that little piece of plastic from Shimano called the shark fin helped counter that. Um, pretty cool. There's also one called a shark tooth that you could get for uh, U-brakes, but uh, that's a whole other product. Uh, I've been battering on, um, battering, I can't even get my words out now. I've been talking about this quite enough now. I think you don't need to see any more pictures other than this one last shot here where you can see the frame, uh, the s work. So um, am I right in thinking that that one is a bonded frame? s works carbon, so it's got the lugs and they bond in the joins. Uh, that would explain why you could see the lugs there down by the bottom bracket. Totally forgotten that it was, um, they used to do M2 Metal Matrix, M2 Carbon, they used to do all the different ones, but um, yeah, beautiful to see. And you can see again on the head tube there, and you've got a Chris King headset too. Double winner. What an awesome selection. Thank you so much, Paul, for sending those in. Um, hopefully people could sort of make the most of my random ramblings. Um, I love looking at pictures anyway, and I love talking about this stuff. So um, hopefully you guys like seeing it too. And I know by the amount of entries we get in that uh, certainly enough of you do. But anything old, keep it coming. And now it is time for the tech quiz answers. So the first question, where are EXT from? It is of course Italy. So Franco Fratton, who's one of the kind of main figureheads behind the brand, actually worked with the likes of Mika Hakkinen, Carlos Sainz Sr. and Sebastian Loeb in motorsport with his brand, which eventually came to mountain biking a few years later. Now, what is the difference between a four bar and a faux bar? Well, it depends where that pivot goes near the rear axle, whether it goes on the chainstay like a four bar or a seat stay like a faux bar. 
Now, if it goes in the seat stay, you basically got a long swing arm. So it kind of makes it a linkage driven single pivot, but it gets a bit complicated. And I think faux bar is just a better name. It's more fun. And the last question, which of those bikes is not part of the specialized lineup? It is of course the Trek Session, as in looks like A. So um, yeah, how do you get on with those questions, guys? You'll have to let us know in the comments below. Now guys, thank you very much for watching the show. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and get in the comments to let us know what you thought of some of those bits floating about on Instagram. What are the pages on Instagram that you follow that you think that we should be taking a look at? Thanks guys, and we'll see you next time.